The first hole today appeared in John McCain's blanket denial of the New York Times report that he was too close, platonically, to a Washington lobbyist who represented, among other interest groups, a TV mogul who wanted to buy a station in Pittsburgh. Our fourth story on the countdown, the McCain denial contradicted by McCain. The Times had reported that Senator McCain had, on behalf of Vicki Eisman, lobbied the FCC to approve the purchase by Paxson Communications. The McCain campaign immediately issued a point-by-point -point rebuttal, saying the letters in 1999, which McCain wrote to the FCC, were routine, and that McCain had never spoken about the Pittsburgh station to any lobbyist or anybody in the Paxson company, just as Paxson was donating $20,000 to his campaign. But today, Newsweek quotes a deposition in which, five and a half years ago, McCain swore the exact opposite was true. Quote, I was contacted by Mr. Paxson on this issue. He wanted their approval very bad for purposes of his business. I believe that Mr. Paxson had a legitimate complaint. The deposition on September 25th, 2002, was from a lawsuit over all things, the constitutionality of the McCain-Feingold resolution. In it, McCain also swears he could not recall if he'd spoken to a lobbyist, but, quote, I'm sure I spoke to Bud Paxson. McCain camp now says he was swearing metaphorically that when he said he was contacted by Paxson and he spoke to Paxson, he meant somebody on his staff. The senator, meantime, continued to try to have it both ways, refusing to take any questions about the story while campaigning at Indianapolis, while at the same time continuing to try to raise money based on the Times report with his campaign's most successful fundraising email to date. It read in part, Objective observers are viewing this article exactly as they should, as a sleazy smear attack from a liberal newspaper against the conservative Republican frontrunner. Sean Hannity said, after reading the article three times, etc., Washington attorney Bob Bennett who was the Democrat counsel during the Keating investigation, said, etc. Objective observer Bob Bennett is McCain's attorney. Objective observer Sean Hannity is Sean Hannity. Another objective observer, White House spokesman Scott Stanzel, addressed the McCain story today off camera. I think a lot of people here in this building with experience in a couple campaigns have grown accustomed to the fact that during the course of a campaign about seemingly on maybe a monthly basis leading up to the convention, maybe a weekly basis after that, the New York Times does try to drop a bombshell on the Republican nominee, and that is something that the Republican nominee has faced in the past and probably will face in this campaign, and sometimes they will make incredible leaps to try to drop those bombshells on the Republican nominees. Well, the Republicans could always preclude that by nominating honest candidates, but who am I to suggest anybody go overturning traditions? Let's bring in MSNBC's David Schuster in Washington for more on this. David, good evening. Good evening, Keith. The deposition that Newsweek came up with seems um, pretty slam dunk, but it's also pretty narrow. But if you put a blanket denial out there, you have raised the bar. Why did they do it that way? Did they not know that one inaccuracy, if it, even if it were maybe an innocent inaccuracy, would restart the whole story? Well, Keith, part of the problem, as it was described to me, was that the McCain campaign was not expecting that the New York Times story would focus on these 1999 letters uh, that McCain wrote to the FCC. And that's because the story about those letters had been written by the New York Times the next year during the McCain 2000 campaign. Of course, the deposition came later. So in the midst of the effort to rebut the entire story yesterday, people working on Senator McCain's behalf were either not familiar with that 2002 deposition or had forgotten the specifics of the story that first came out in 2000. Again, uh, you could argue it doesn't excuse the inaccuracy, but it does help to understand that the expectation from the McCain campaign, if the story came to pass, was they expected that most, if not all, of the story would be focusing on McCain's relationship with Vicki Eisman and not on these letters or these issues that the uh, New York Times had already written about. The nature of the evidence that has just turned up uh, in the Newsweek piece today, that's not a friend of a friend of a friend with some anonymous quote here. Um, I know your point was made that they were looking for something else in the story and not the FCC Paxson issue, but they, ha they knew something was coming for literally months, a negative story with several key component parts, and within 24 hours somebody produces a legal document yeah. in which Senator McCain contradicts his own denial. Is there somebody still you know, who could be described as asleep at the switch over there in, in uh, McCain uh, Damage Control Headquarters? Yeah, absolutely. And clearly uh, the wrong person at, the, uh, at that switch. Um, McCain clearly should have looked at or edited himself this rebuttal that was coming from his staff under his name. Or he should have talked with lawyers 
or the staff should have talked with lawyers who were involved in the deposition. But, Keith, to McCain supporters, they see a bigger issue of concern that they believe uh, could be easier and perhaps more damaging for people to understand. And that is, yesterday on camera, John McCain denied that his staff spoke to him about Vicki Eisman. The New York Times reported that the staff did speak to John McCain about Vicki Eisman. So there you have a clear contradiction. And as it stands, the credibility of Bill Keller, the executive uh, editor at the New York Times, and the credibility of his newspaper is on the line. And so the big question, as one McCain supporter suggested to me tonight, the big question is whether or not this battle is over or whether the New York Times, which has the entire barrel of ink, has decided no. We're going to put out more in the story to explain why we did this story in the first place. And every other news organization in America, by the way, which is always you know, smells the blood in the water. Um, there are three other things going on with McCain. Uh, he's got to answer questions about the FEC for that loan, which he may have used public financing as collateral. The Washington Post uh, detailed the bevy of, of campaign advisors who are lobbyists or who have been. Uh, Richard Renzi, his co-chair in Arizona, the congressman, indicted on corruption charges that have nothing to do with McCain's campaign. But at, at, at some point, does this stuff, this confluence of stuff, uh, raise issues of hypocrisy, culture of corruption, and dovetail back into what the point of the Times piece was in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. And Howard Dean, the Democratic Party chair, is already trying to make that the issue and suggest that look at all these tangled connections that McCain has at the time that he's saying that he's above the influence of lobbyists and la lawmakers and legislation. So clearly the Democrats um, are already thrilled that they're going to have this material to work with. But Keith, a couple of Democrats have pointed out that uh, under their wish list, they wish this story had come out later, either in the summer or in the fall, because they, they're worried that perhaps this sort of expectation of, well, this is how senators do business, that that will sort of, that'll sort of fade, and that the story, if it doesn't go anywhere, will fade, and that it won't be an issue that it might have been had it happened later in this campaign. Good point. David Schuster of MSNBC, welcome back. Thanks, Keith.